Hi, everybody. My name is Andy Reid. Welcome to the Isolation Island Concour presented by Haggerty Drivers Club, our first video presentation. I'm here with Paul Russell and Vu Gwen, uh, two very well-respected people. Uh, Vu is the executive director of the Porsche Club. He's also, as you can see from behind him, a pretty serious die-cast collector um, or model car collector, to be precise. His first model car that he doesn't have anymore, that was a, anything significant, was a Saab 900 in Burgundy. In what, what 118th or 143? 118th scale. 118. 118. And he lost it. And I actually went on eBay trying to find him one yesterday and then went on Google trying to find him one yesterday. And he, I can't find it, nor can he. So if you have a Burgundy 118 Saab 900, not 900 Turbo, but plain old 900, let him know because yeah. he's interested. Uh, Paul Russell is the owner, founder of Paul Russell and Company. And Paul Russell and Company is the winningest restoration shop at Pebble Beach. Cars through his shop have won more than 50 best of show awards across the world. Uh, I've been there. It is the absolute model for a restoration shop. I've been to many, many restoration shops. I insure a lot of them, in fact. And I've never seen a facility like his. And it's more of a facility than it is a shop. Uh, it, it's astounding. There's a research department. There's a painting department. Everything. It's kind of fantastic. So we're really happy to have them with us as judges and to do this video display. Uh, so what we wanted to talk about, because people are asking, is what criteria people, what criteria we should, you know, pe they're using as judges to pick their winners of class and best of show. So you want to chime in? My, my first question, I had a list of questions here. My first question is that that was exactly it. What criteria makes a winner for you guys? For me, um, I look at the build quality of the model, which, um, you know, the, the detail is just uh, obviously incorporated in that as part of that. Um, I look at um, how the history of the car is, uh, has been presented, um, as well as um, what the personal history is of the um, presenter with the car model. Why did he buy it? Why does he own it? What's, what's uh, fun and interesting about the car uh, for them? Um, and to the extent that that story conveys some, you know, emotional investment uh, on the part of the entrant with the car or with the full scale car that, that the model represents. Um, you know, to a large degree, um, you know, you termed it at the isolation concourse. So uh, I'm looking at it not unlike a real world concourse uh, where there's a car on the lawn. So it's obviously condition, authenticity, presentation. It, it all is part of the package in my view. Now, how much is a Ferrari 250 GTO, since you're an Italian class, or an Alfa Stradale 33 like this, compared to the little uh, Balanchina we just saw, what is the difference? Between, does that make a difference of the car model they pick, or is it much more the presentation and the story with those cars? It's much more the presentation and the story for me. I mean, clearly, um, if you start with a Tipo 33 or a GTO, you've got something sensational to begin with. But um, what's the story of that car and in terms of what does the model, you know, represent? And, um, you know, the package between the history of the car and why it was produced, but the personal history, uh, why a little... Um, you know, Fiat 500 uh, could mean something um, significant to the entrant uh, is all, you know, in combination. So I think what you're getting at, does the GTO model have an advantage in my book? No, not really. How about you, Vu? What do you think? Yeah, to echo what Paul just mentioned, for me, it's overall level of effort, right? 
And um, there's many components that can contribute to the overall level of effort. And it might start with if you have a strong model car, um, you know, that kind of raises the bar. But even if you had, you know, a standard off the shelf car, but you presented it well, you took stellar photography like this, uh, this particular model, or you, you built parts of it to customize it, you tied it in with the personal story, the overall level of effort is what I'm looking for. Someone that simply plucks a car out of their collection and puts it on a table and takes, you know, random shots of it and doesn't share anything with us, they're not going to be a contender. But if they take the time to do many of the components right, the overall level of effort is what's going to have them rise above the rest of the cars. How about photography? How, how important is photography? Could you have decent, okay, fair photography and an extraordinary story and that would win, that would, that would put that car above high, higher level photography, you guys, or? For me, I, photography is very emotional because we can't be there to look at the cars in person. If you do a good job taking photos and, you know, present it well, that's only going to add to your, to your submission. Um, so they, again, they take the time to do it it's going to be in their favor. I agree with that. And, and, you know, actually I made myself a little judging sheet and, uh, you know, with a, not to get too uh, overly technical about it, but just kind of a grade of one to five on uh, different um, elements of the presentation photography being one of them. And uh, some of it, as we all know, was phenomenal and, some of it, I was surprised that, um, you know, maybe the headlight was in focus and the rest of the car was fuzzy. And uh, in this day and age of uh, digital photography, where you can review your own photographs before you submit them and um, pick great ones or improve them if they don't come out wide, it's all part of the effort, I think, that it goes into the presentation. So it's quite important. One of the things I want to point out is a lot of people may be intimidated by seeing some of the submissions in the past of how amazingly shot they are, um, but they, should, they shouldn't be intimidated because with these scale models, our cell phones, today's most cell phones today take amazing macro shots and lighting and such is very simple. Like all of my submissions, I mean, I, I had a poster board, I had my phone and just natural lighting. Um, you can have amazing shots without having, because some of these, let's be honest, some of these shots look like they're done in some professional studio, and they may have been, but to be a contender, like the shot of this uh, three series here, that's on my desk with a poster board and my iPhone. Um, so don't be intimidated by, uh, you know, shots that other people are submitting, because you can get it with, uh, with, with your iPhone. And I would say use the shots that other people are getting that you admire Copy them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we all learn from other presenters if you go to a concourse field and see what people are doing and how it's being done and uh, what cars are successful uh, and maybe the success um, seems to outlie what the car actually is because of phenomenal presentation. I mean, look at what other people are doing and get inspired. <laughs> Do you guys have a favorite entry? that you've seen, either one of you? One of my favorite entries was the Porsche 917, uh, kind of in a tribute to Porsche's uh, first overall win at, uh, at Le Mans uh, with Dickie Atwood driving. And, it, and really, if I recall, there's only th three pictures, but it was a very, very rainy event and the model was put together in this little diorama of um of a, of a rainy day with the you know clouds of um spray coming off the tires and stuff it was a phenomenal effort even it's in a little case that has uh, the uh, rain and sleet coming down uh to replicate you know the time of the day it was just very very clever as well as they started with a certain model and then they added uh, a modeler's touch to it in which they, you know, put a driver in the car and, and to, you know, fill out this diorama. It wasn't just, you know, the car parked in the pits or something. Uh, really a great effort um, 
that was very, very effective. Yeah, that one was my favorite as well. And again, we're talking about level of effort. That was through the moon. I mean, just just how they they portrayed the car and laid it out and all the extra details. That was just an amazing submission. So that was my favorite. Fantastic. Are there any secrets that you guys want to give of how you judge? Like any tricks that you want to say, hey, if you want to rise above the rest, here is something you might think about doing either with description, photographs, what have you. I mean, is a diorama critical or is it not critical? Or is there something else that they can add to it um, that they have done thus far? I wouldn't say a diorama is critical, um, but what you should do is, especially in your classes or in the past, um, you know, see what, see what the judges have chosen in the past. What are we, we're on eight now on uh, the past seven, seven uh, award winners, uh, maybe even up in the other classes as well, as, as Paul mentioned, is learn from the winners, see what they've done. Was it the story? Was it the car? Was it the presentation? And figure out what you have to offer and try to bring that level for each little component. And um, that's how you'll be successful. That's a hot wheel we just saw, that that 935. That's yeah. somebody on a hot wheel. I mean, it's not, yeah. that's, you know, that is that is a bone stock Hot Wheel, but presented very well, and shot you know with a probably with an iPhone and a Mac. You know the like I said, the iPhones or or cell phones are able to do macro shots, and they look incredible. How about you, Paul? I would uh, echo that. I guess to to see what other people have done done, but also um, I would say don't be afraid to inject some. A personal story and a personal and emotion to it. Some of the cars that uh, Massimo Delbo and I judged, um, you know, they they talked about what the model was and all of this, but they talked about also uh, visiting a certain place or a garage or a museum when they were 14 years old and being gifted the model and they still have it and, you know, they're 40 now and, and uh, what it meant to them and uh, why they chose that particular model on that day when they were 12 years old. I mean, it just adds so much uh, color to it and it keeps it light. You know, this is, this is all supposed to be fun and entertainment, you know. So and you the, prim the prime, ex not to cut you off there, Paul, but the prime example, since the photo's up there, that 911, I believe that's Jay's car, you know, it wasn't really presented that well in sort of photography. Why is it sitting on top of his, his real car? But the story, as you mentioned, is what drew us into picking that one because it was a car that belonged to, I believe, a little old lady. And, you know, he was able to get it. And then the, the, the manufacturer of that model was actually able to make the perfect match to his one-to-one one, one one car. So, like you said, the, the story yeah. is what pulled us into and, and pulled that one as a winner. Yeah, we've had a couple of those where people have the big car and the little car at the various different levels of the big car. And the, I know you've seen some of those, Paul, in your class because yeah. we had Ferrari 212 in there and it's, it's very, very strategically placed in front of his full-size one-to-one -one scale, one of 212, and, right. Um, right. which is interesting. Um, but yeah, this funny thing is the Jay's car, his big car, the regular Concours, would have just been another 75 911. Yeah. And, uh, but his little car at the little Concours, because of the story involved, won him, won the award, won the class. Yeah. And well, the like, like Paul said, this, this is all about being, you know, having fun, sharing your story. The model is what gets you into the show, but it's the story behind it and your efforts is what's going to get you to win. Yep. Anything else you, you guys see that it's, what, what intrigues you to the whole thing? I mean, I, you guys got involved and were involved from the get go. And I, Quite honestly, was very surprised that Paul was involved and still is involved. And uh, I knew you'd be involved because we talked that night when we did you did the Concord on the the cars and coffee on the carpet for the whole idea. Uh, but uh, I'm just, it seems like you're both having fun. We're having fun, and um, you know the creativity that we're seeing in some of the entrants. Um, you know, some of the models that we've judged were something that you could. Um, it was a representative of certain car and year and model, but then they took it in and, and a builder then either built it from scratch or 
modified it to represent a certain story and a certain uh, point in time that was meaningful to them or meaningful in automotive history. And uh, the things that people add to a model that you get in a box were really uh, fun and fascinating. For me, plain and simple, this is a justification for me hoarding 118. <laughs> Absolutely no other reason than that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you, you know, it's just the pains of not being able to do the normal car stuff uh, in the past couple of months. And, and that's why I did cars and carpets. And, um, you know, we have, all of us have these cars sitting around. Uh, we enjoy them personally. Uh, not everyone is able to come over to your house or your shop or whatever it is to see them. But now we have a platform to share all these models that we've collected over the years. And you know, no matter what brand you're, you're kind of affiliated with, so to speak, um, as you can look from the collection behind me, we love all cars and being able to share and see some of the oddball ones are cool. So I'm seeing the ones that, you know, you kind of look up to uh, growing up. It's just, it's just something for us to be able to do and keep our mind engaged with cars um, that we, we normally would be doing uh, if, if the world was normal. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, your funniest entry, the, the chairman of PCA uh, uh, entered a Pontiac Fiero. That was the funniest thing you've ever <laughs> Again, justification for owning a 118 scale Pontiac Fiero. <laughs> but no, you have a deeper story with the Fiero though that you told on the Yeah. The- that, that was it was my it was my first car. And you know, thankfully someone decided it would be a good idea to make a 118 scale Pontiac Fiero S E. Um, and I happened to be the one person that probably wanted to buy that model. So I did. Do you have these things at home too, Paul, or at this office? I do, um, you know, and I, I could have um, a collection of models that would overwhelm my uh, office space, but I pretty much try to stick to cars that uh, are personally meaningful to me. I have a beautiful little 143rd scale model of the 1950 Millimilia winning um, Touring Berlinetta, and uh, I had just a phenomenal opportunity while we were restoring that car for Jack Crowell to meet uh, Chichi Andaloni and to meet uh, Gianni Marzato and uh, to get the full story and the full experience. And, uh, and it's just a privilege to be involved with that car. And so an opportunity for um, came to acquire a small model that was done in just the right colors and the paint numbers for the Millimilia and all that. And, I I couldn't resist. Nice. Yeah. And I I think these models, you know, when we first started, maybe as kids or or youngsters, like we just got whatever we could get, right. As long as it was available at the store and mom and dad would allow us to buy it. But as you move along and you see the crowd of cars, you start to think about um, buying cars that serves as reminders of wonderful memories that you've had in the past. And as you really grow your collection, and run out of space. Now, for me, the car has to have some sort of significant memory in order for me to buy because I'm just literally out of space. And stories yeah. like you said, you know, knowing the drivers, or I have a um, 918 Spider that Frank Volliser was presenting um, and signed for me. I have a 993 Turbo that Tony Hatter has signed with me. I have a 959 that I've driven. So it's, you know, all these cars now. Um, are, are part of, you know, keep cataloging my memories of, of significant things. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot cheaper than trying to buy the real ones. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorites personally is I've got a uh, 143rd of the Janus Shop and Porsche 356. Uh, the reason I've got that is because it was a gift after I took the 356. To, I could never afford to buy the real car at $1.76 million, but... Yeah. I, I brought it to auction for the seller to RM and they did, they thought they'd do $800,000. And as a gift, I, I was given that by someone who knew about the whole deal I'd set up. And it's one of my cherished ones because right. it has, I have a connection to it. Like all, I either have a situation yeah. or I've owned it. It's either I've owned the car, desperately would love to have the car and have driven it, or I've taken it to auction and set some crazy record. So. 
Well, thank you so much, Andy, for pulling all this together. I, you know, you probably don't get enough kudos and people are just submitting and, and much like event organizers, um, you know, they're the last ones that receive thank yous, but uh, without you and without your, your, uh, your, your vision to, to do this, you know, we wouldn't have this, this opportunity to share, you know, some of our treasures. Well, thank Amen. you. Amen. Well, thanks again. Any parting words for, uh, hopeful winners or entrants submit 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 we want to see your cars <laughs> yeah well thanks very much guys you're welcome right. take care